I am excited today to talk about something that was what Jesus talked about the most. It's the most referenced topic from Jesus in the entire uh, New Testament. All the stories written about Jesus is the kingdom of God. He talked about it more than anything else there is, is the kingdom. Now, sometimes he called it the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes he called it the kingdom of God. Sometimes just the kingdom but it's what he talked about the most. And so I think it's really super important for us, especially as we're looking at our new direction as a church family and where we're going and what God is calling us into, to pay attention to the thing that God taught, or the thing that Jesus talked about more than anything else. And it's not just the kingdom coming in us, but it's also the kingdom coming through us. So over the next four weeks, we are going to be talking about the kingdom come. And we're going to be looking at the different words that Jesus said and the things he taught about the kingdom, but also what it looked like for Jesus to express the kingdom in his everyday life. Um, My family has been doing our best. Uh, We're certainly not a perfect example of it, but we've been doing our best to be an example of what it looks like to be people who soak in the kingdom, but also bring the kingdom to those around them. And uh, one of the ways we did that is we had a season of life where we were uh, particularly called to high school students from broken families. And so what we did is we welcomed them in around our table every, uh, I think it was Thursdays, and maybe it changed around a little bit, but every Thursday we would have them around our table for dinner. And then we would uh, say what we were thankful for just as an act of worship to God. We would just go around the table and we'd say, what are you thankful for? And sometimes that would take a little while, not only because maybe sometimes there would be 20 people around the table, but also because because if you've ever had a conversation with a high school student, sometimes that's a little scattered. Um, but also adults don't giggle too much. I've had conversations with plenty of adults just as scattered. So <laughs> but it would take us a little while to get around the table and, and share what we were thankful for. But then we would just simply have a, a simple declaration of who God was to our family and, and what the Bible says about that. And it was really discussion-based. And then we would pray. And our goal was to have just as many, if not more, people around our table who were not Christians than who were Christians. And it was important to us because we feel like like God's whole mission to the world is to restore the world and not just us who go to church, but those who are outside of the church, that nobody is outside of the blessing and the love and the experience of God. And so we would invite them around our table and we would share food. And for some of them, it was the first time or the only time, at least during the week, that they would get together with what felt like a family for a meal. And they were eager to, to give thanks and they were eager to talk and to connect and all of that good stuff. And because of the nature of our mission with that and how... Uh, how many people were outside of the church that were coming in and gathering. We would have some that would invite their friends and they would say, hey, uh, so-and-so is coming tonight. She's she's like a, a, a hardline atheist. So if you could just like, take it a little bit easy with the Jesus talk, that would be awesome. And uh, we don't want to scare her away. And we're like, hey, but like the the whole purpose of this family, like the the main reason this family exists is to uh, be in relationship with the Lord. So we're always going to be sharing that. And they're like, okay, but like, could you please just, you know, not maybe so much. And what we found is that no matter how many times something like that happened or somebody came in that was this hard line, I'm against church or against Jesus, what we found time and time again is they were incredibly open and excited to be there. And at the least likely times, now the least likely time that I would think for somebody who is outside of the church or just completely uncomfortable with anything church or Jesus oriented would be prayer time. But the experience and and our experience uh, with a lot of people has shown just the exact opposite. That maybe they were a little shy and reserved in, in sharing something personal. Maybe they were a little shy and reserved about entering into conversation. But prayer time, when prayer time came, those who were supposed to be the farthest from God were usually the first to enter in and receive prayer. Their hands would shoot up and say, I heard my friend's prayer got answered last week, so that's why I'm here this week. I'm here because I actually heard that God answers prayers here and just like crazy kinds of prayers, like the the kind that shouldn't be answered, but they're being answered. And so I thought maybe you guys could pray for me. And we were just blown away. But we learned something in that as well, is that there are generations, and not just the younger generation, but all the generations have something in common when it comes to our faith, is that we don't want a faith that doesn't affect our day-to-day. We don't want a faith that doesn't affect the here and now. 
I think there was a season where the church allowed itself to be a passive passer on of information. But what we're finding is that doesn't work anymore. That there is more to it and there always has been more to it. We just haven't always been good at the more. And now there are generations that are coming up that won't settle for less. In fact, they're experiencing things in the here and now at their fingertips constantly. Uh, George Barna, um, or the, the Barna Research Institute, uh, David McKin- uh, Kinneman is the president of the Barna Research Institute right now, and he has defined what is happening in our culture and what is happening all the times in the here and now that's available at our fingertips, this constant need for instant um, uh, experience as a digital Babylon. Now, he uses the metaphor of Babylon because Babylon historically and scripturally has always been a metaphor for a a number of kingdoms and the impact that they've had on the world around them. But he's not just referring to it metaphorically, uh, although it's applied to us metaphorically. He's referring to the literal Babylon that we see the Jews in exile uh, under the, the kingdom of Babylon. And so he uses that as a, as a parallel saying, look at what happened in the kingdom of Babylon when Israel went into exile in Babylon. Babylon was genius. They didn't have to go around squashing every single rebellion because they had figured out a much more intelligent way to bring people into their kingdom after they had conquered them once. They didn't have to keep messing with these resurgences of rebellion because what they would do is they would take the youngest, brightest, up-and-coming, and current leaders in the nation that they just conquered. They would feed them from the king's table. They would train them so that they looked and were better and were healthier than they ever had been before. And then for three years, they would indoctrinate them with the readings and writing literature and, and sayings and religious practices of the Babylonian kingdom. And so they didn't have to worry about rebellions anymore because now those who were the most influential in the nation that they had conquered were now leading their nation into Babylonian culture. They had completely indoctrinated this, this, an entire generation over three years into the Babylonian culture. So they didn't have to worry about uprisings anymore. All they had to do was do discipleship really, really well. Well, what Barna Research has, has found through their, through their studies and through the statistics and what Dave McKinnon writes on, in, a, in a number of his books is the effect of a digital Babylon in our here and in our now. That these things that we carry around in our pockets that are portable screens, that the screens that we have in our living rooms and all over the place. Um, we were watching the New York, uh, New York New Year's Eve ball drop because then we could go to bed at like 9.30 and it was a really wonderful way to do it. Normally we have to watch that uh, when we were in Michigan at midnight and we had to stay up that late, but now it's like, you guys have had it right all along. <laughs> you get to watch the nine o'clock one, it's the legit one, not the Netflix one, and then you get to go to bed, that's brilliant. So. Anyway, like I was just watching that in New York, uh, the the downtown, everything's just covered in screens. And I I had been studying and reading about this digital Babylon. I was like, oh, wow, it's everywhere. That there's, there's this prevailing discipling current and culture that we can understand as a digital Babylon that's taking our youngest and brightest and it's, it's indoctrinating them. And what Barna has found out and what Dave Kinneman writes about is there are three effects of a digital Babylon. Now, the first effect is a phenomenal access. So we kind of discussed that already briefly in that everything is available in a moment at a touch. For good or bad, everything is available to us in the flipping on of a screen or in the touch of our phone, for good or bad. It can be, uh, you know, good to connect with friends. It can be good to reach out to relatives that maybe are across, across the country or even across the world, and we can feel like we're keeping up in the here and in the now. Right? But it can also be used for bad things because right, some of that t- sometimes that hit of dopamine that we try to hide from other people is also just a button push away. So we have a phenomenal access. Everything is instantaneously accessible. I can experience it right now. The second thing David uh, Kinneman talks about is a profound alienation. 
in a more connected culture than we have ever had before, digital connection has led to profound alienation. Because the reality is, though you can interact with anybody at the touch of a button in an instant, the reality is you're not actually interacting with them. What are you interacting with? A phone. You're interacting with a screen, not a person, not a face. You're interacting with somebody's uh, persona that they put out on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, wherever you're going, that's what you're interacting with. And it, it gives the uh, appearance that we're actually connecting, but the reality is we're not. And what has led to, and you can look up statistics on mental health and all of that has, has uh, been affected by a profound alienation. That in a, a world where we've never been connected more, we actually have never felt more alone. And the third thing that David Kinnaman points to is a crisis of authority. Do you know what happens when you have an uh, entire internet in your pocket at all times? Janine hates this when, when we're in arguments. She's like, well, this is what I, like, this is the truth here. I'm like, oh yeah, well, let's fact check that right now. <laughs> like, let's just Google it. But the problem is you, like you Google something and y yeah, you can fact check anything you want, but then all sorts of things pull up. And so we have a crisis of authority within first the fact of what news source do I go to? What information source am I going to be pulling from? But then secondly, I now have an authority uh, crisis with those around me because now I'm appealing to a screen every single time. I'm appealing to digital Babylon, another kingdom, any single time that there's an argument. So the authority is no longer relational from person to person. The authority is now, what can I find online? And then amongst what I can find online, who is actually right? Anybody else been struggling with that? Like you find authoritative, seemingly authoritative things on both sides of an argument, and at the end of the day, it comes down to what do I think? Which one do I like better? What supports my argument more? I'm gonna go with that. If a doctor wrote both, I'll go with that doctor because that's what I was already thinking. And so more than ever, actually, the authority becomes me. And digital Babylon empowers me. And digital Babylon puts me on the throne once again. But it's having devastating effects. But this is the discipling current. We have a digital Babylon, and it is an incredibly effective kingdom. It's incredibly effective because what it comes down to is that there is every generation wants things impacting their life in the here and now, and this seems to impact us in the here and the now, and it does, but not in the way we thought it would. We're not getting out of it what we thought we could get out of it. Jesus was in a Babylon as well. Rome was considered a Babylon. It was a, uh, Babylon was an archetype and Rome was an expression of the spirit of Babylon. And Jesus in, in the midst of a virtual Babylon stands up and he proclaims another kingdom. A kingdom that is more powerful and can drive back the darkness of Babylon. And I think if we pay attention to it, it can drive back our Babylon, whether it's digital or a Babylon in our hearts. The kingdom of God can do that. So we're going to take a look uh, at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. If you've grown up in church, this may be a very, very familiar passage for you. And um, it's one that's familiar to me. I pray it all the time. It's the, it's the prayer that Jesus taught those who follow him to pray. It's the prayer that his closest followers, it's a pattern prayer that he taught them to pray. And um, so we're going to take a look at it because there's some really interesting things if we dive into it. It says this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we have a lot of things going on. While this prayer is attributed to Jesus, what's interesting about it is the bits and pieces that we find in this prayer are not written by Jesus. They're actually compiled by Jesus. So in that sense, in the compilation of it, it is unique to Jesus. But outside of that, it's actually not unique to Jesus. In fact, the first line comes from a regularly practiced Jewish prayer called the Kaddish. And the, in the original, it goes like this. Exalted and hallowed be his great name. In the world that he created, according to his will, may he cause his kingdom to reign. 
That's what the Kaddish is. So what Jesus does here is he actually just takes the Kaddish and puts it at the beginning of a prayer that is longer and made up of all different other bits and pieces of prayers that would be regularly prayed prayers in a Jewish household. But there is something different about this, and we're going to get to that in a second. So first, what happens is, is Jesus is praying, and he, he starts by praying the Kiddush, and it starts with, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, when I hear this regularly talked about, I hear this is the beginning of the Jesus prayer, the beginning of the Lord's prayer, and it really just starts with worship, right? It's Jesus worshiping the Father. Well, it includes that, but that's actually not what's happening here. That's at least not what Jesus' hearers would have understood, and it's not historically what Jews would have understood either. In fact, what Jesus is saying here and what Jews had been practicing in their prayer for quite some time in our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, is this understanding. What they're doing is they're asking for a revelation of God. Oh, it absolutely includes worship, right? When God is revealed, when his holiness is revealed, hallowed be your name is about the holiness of God. It would actually lead to worship, but what the Jewish people had been doing for years and years and years, and what Jesus echoes here, is a begging, a pleading for the revelation of the holiness of God, that God would show up in our reality, that Yahweh, the creator of the universe, would reveal himself and prove himself to be holy. So when we pray, when we hear Jesus pray this prayer, uh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what he's saying is, Yahweh, reveal your holiness. Reveal yourself. Now that does lead us to worship, but worship is not the primary function of this. It's asking for the inbreaking of the creator God into our reality in the here and in the now so that nobody can contest it. Now, when we understand the prayer that way, it actually sets everything up just a little bit differently. If we move on and we talk about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when we think about a kingdom, and, and the word used here is translated into English as kingdom, we would understand it as like a geographical boundaried area. We think about it historically maybe with walls and gates and, uh, and you know, those little high up places that the archers would shoot down and maybe holes through the, the, the stone and stuff like that. Like that's what comes to mind when I think of a kingdom as knights and King Arthur and all of that good stuff. And while there was a word used for that kind of a kingdom, a geographic uh, boundary kingdom, that's not the word that Jesus uses here. The word that Jesus uses here actually can be defined this way, and we'll have it up on the slide. The uh, revealed kingdom is actually going to be understood as um, the kingship, the dominion, the rule, royal power, and it's not to be confused with the actual kingdom, not the, the geographic boundary kingdom, but rather the right or authority to rule over a kingdom. So you really had two understandings of a kingdom. You had the geographic region and boundaries of a kingdom, where the limits of it were and who was in the kingdom and who was out of the kingdom. But then you had the king's power itself. And you would know the king's power because he would have images set up all over the boundary kingdom of who was ruling and who sat on the throne. But you understood that to represent the actual authority, the, the, the royal power that when he is here, he can enact and he can rule anywhere where he wants to influence his rule and reign. And his rule and reign affected the here and the now. When the king came in, there was an understanding that something was going to happen. The king doesn't just walk through the streets. He doesn't just amble around. He, he does stuff. He comes for a reason. And historically, the king wasn't always around for a good reason. He usually took, and he usually exacted taxes, and all the king's land was his, and, and you served the king. But Jesus is setting up a different type of a kingship. In fact, everything that we see that follows in this passage that is made up of bits and pieces of other prayers is all about what it looks like when God is revealed, when Yahweh proves his holiness, is breaking into our here and now, and we ask for God's rule and reign in our here and now. That's what Jesus is setting up. God, reveal yourself to us in our daily, everyday, mundane activities. Prove your holiness and allow your rule and reign, your authority to rule, your royal power to enter into our here and now on earth, just as it is in heaven, uncontested, benevolent, as things are in heaven where you dwell, may it be here on earth where I dwell. 
an uncontested power and an uncontested ruling and reigning in our here and in our now. So we take a look at what that looks like as we follow along in the prayer. So Yahweh breaks in, his holiness is proved. We ask for his rule and reign, his authority, his power to rule and reign to come on earth as it is in heaven. And what does that look like? The rest of the prayer reveals it to us. We're going to walk through it a little bit quickly. Give us today our daily bread. So in God's kingdom, when when Yahweh is revealed and his holiness is revealed to us and the rule and reign of God is exercised on earth as it is in heaven, the first thing that happens is the kingdom and those in it have what they need. They're provided for by the king. So Jesus is, is, you know, using the examples of kingship everywhere else, and they would have understood that as a king taking. But in, in this kingdom, when God shows up, and when Jesus is, is over all and he rules and reigns, what that actually means is you don't provide for me. The king provides for you. The king doesn't take, he doesn't exact, he doesn't, he doesn't rule in that way through, through manipulating. He actually uses his rule and reign to serve you and to provide, to meet your needs. In the kingdom, there, aren't a, 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 there isn't a fat and fed king and hungry and impoverished citizens. There is a king who pours himself out and there are well-fed and well-cared for and people who have everything they need. And it is a beautiful, beautiful picture. This goes beyond just having what we need to eat and to wear, but it also goes to the emotional level that what Jesus is talking about is when the kingdom breaks in and Jesus is exercising his rule and reign, you have what you need emotionally. You have what you need socially. You have what you need physically. All of these realms of who we are are satisfied in the kingdom of God when his rule and reign breaks into our here and our now. And I want to say that this last week, we as a family, I have just, I have been so impressed with you oh, more than over this last week. We've had a couple of people who have tested positive for COVID lately. Uh, we've had people that have been going through surgery. And each time something like this happens, I have seen you guys rise up and I've seen the provision of God come through your hands. You have fed people. I can't tell you how many times over the last couple of weeks I've seen a meal train come up because somebody is sick and say, hey, I've got this week. I've got this day. I've got this day. Well, I'm doing lunch. I'm dropping them off a quiche. I'm doing this. It's beautiful. That is what the kingdom of God looks like, that when there is a need, the power of God moves the hearts of people to meet that need. God has always extended his rule and reign through people. And we're going to be talking more about that over the coming weeks. But God has always extended the rule, his rule and reign, his authority, his uh, exercise of his power through people. And I've seen him exercise his rule and reign through pr- for provision through you over the last few weeks. And it is just, it's amazing. If you haven't been a part of this family very long, it, you don't have to be in order to receive that. Some of the people we've seen have only been around for a few weeks and they have already been experiencing the love of God pouring out because that's what God is doing in this people. I believe that this is a family, this is a spiritual family that is being filled up and will continue to be filled up with the presence and the kingdom of God. So just thank you for that. But that's what the provision of God looks like. We move on. And forgive us our debts as we have also... If we, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So in the kingdom, uh, there, it's not just, it's not just uh, uh, punish for the wrongs. This is a kingdom of forgiveness. You see in Babylon, in digital Babylon, if you pay attention, somebody can do something that's wrong. They can make a mistake or act out of their brokenness or do something they legitimately knew to be wrong. And it seems like decades, if ever, that there is forgiveness extended. Now you can watch anybody who is of celebrity status fall from grace and they almost never get back out of that, do they? Their life is ruined, their career is ruined, everything falls apart because we in digital Babylon, we hold grudges. And one wrong move, one mistake, one poor choice is enough to hold it against you for all of a lifetime, but not in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, those who we think probably shouldn't be forgiven are forgiven. And that's actually you and me. 
In the kingdom of heaven, our trespasses and our sins, those things that we did either by mistake, by accident, or on purpose, all we have to do, God's word says, is we, if we are faithful to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It isn't years of trying to earn our way back into grace. It is a simple fixing of broken relationship between us and the Father or us and between one another just simply by confessing our sins. That's what it looks like in this kingdom. But forgiveness doesn't just come to us. It also comes through us in the kingdom that we are reconcilers and those who make others broken relationships right. We receive forgiveness, but we also extend forgiveness. This happens in the kingdom and it is in direct opposition to every other kingdom of darkness and every other archetypal Babylon. He concludes with, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In the kingdom of heaven, there is protection, not just from bodily harm. We see it all throughout Israel's history. We can see that whenever they were going into battle and God was calling them into battle, he would protect them and he would fight for them. He would go before them. He doesn't just do that for them. In that kingdom, he does that for us in his kingdom now. And so we see when we invite the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, in our here and now everyday reality, that we have protection and we have deliverance, not just in physical things. We also have those in spiritual things. The Bible says that the enemy prowls roaring like a lion, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. And that life starts now. You see, here's the reality that we see in this prayer from Jesus is that the rule and reign of God affects our here and our now. Our, the rule and reign of God affects our here and our now. It also looks to the future. It looks to the future because if we stop and we just look at affecting only the here and the now, we start to think about, well, well what about all of the sickness that's currently around us? If God's kingdom is here and now, how come things aren't just fixed? How come there's still brokenness? How come there's still pain? How come there's still death? Why do people still break into cars? Why do still people, uh, people still struggle with addiction? Why are families still split apart if the kingdom effects are here and the now? What is going on? Well, the reality is there is also a future. There is also a future reality. But my friends, I wanna, I wanna just remind us that the church has been so focused on the future that we've forgotten the here and the now that I think sometimes we've been so focused on dying and going to heaven that we forget that heaven is actually meant to invade earth. Jesus didn't pray in his prayer, uh, Father, reveal yourself and let us go to heaven. He said, let your kingdom come to earth, not earth go to heaven. Bishop N.T. Wright says this, our culture is so fixated on dying and going to heaven when the whole of scripture is about heaven coming to earth. The whole of scripture is about heaven coming to earth, not earth going to heaven. It was never an escape plan from earth because we were created for earth, on earth, and we were meant to be on earth, and God's purpose was to dwell with us on earth. So it is not to escape earth. It's to restore it. It's to benefit earth through the rule and the reign of a living God who breaks into our here and our now. And that inbreaking came through the person of Jesus. We think, well, how do we know it came from the here and the now? All we have is a passage of Jesus praying, let your kingdom come, but how can it be here and now if we're praying for it to come? We're gonna go to Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Jesus says this, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus was addressing the very thing that each of us would have wondered in that very same uh, place as the Jewish people. When is God going to come back in in military victory and deliver us a geographic kingdom? And Jesus says, no, the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
He says it's in him, the person of who Jesus is. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I only do what I see the Father doing, and I only say what the Father has given me to say. And another time, he unrolls the scripture of Isaiah, and he reads about the release and the restoration that comes, the freedom that comes when the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, enters into our here and now. And he rolls back up the scroll, and he says, this has been fulfilled in your midst. You see, the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus. The revelation of who Yahweh is comes through the person of Jesus. And because of it, we see lepers and sickness and disease healed. We see the provision of food first for 5,000 and then for 4,000. We see protection and deliverance through the rebuking of the devil and the casting out of demons. But again, we ask the question, but what about now? That's great, but if Jesus brought the kingdom and Jesus left the kingdom, then why do we still have the sickness and the hurt and the pain? This is not my analogy, but it's one of my favorite analogies. I've heard in a number of places, and it's the analogy of D-Day. On the beaches of Normandy, in June 6, 1944, American, British, and Canadian soldiers were part of an elaborate deceptive plan to try to turn the tides of World War II. You see, up until now, it seemed to be a losing battle, but there was a plan that included a lot of deception of uh, making the enemy think we were coming in from another way, but actually attacking head-on one of the most fortified beach fronts that we had. And on June 6, 1944, D-Day was played out, and it was successful. In fact, uh, historically, we consider that the turning point of the war. We went from losing to winning. It said that that was the day the war was won, June 6, 1944. But here's the problem. The war still went on, and Japan did not formally surrender until September 2nd, 1945. And between June 6 and September 2nd, many battles still had to be played out. And some of them didn't go the way we would have hoped they would have gone. Some of the battles still seemed like they were losing, but we won the war on June 6, 1944, even though it wasn't decisive till 1945. The coming of the kingdom is like the tension between June 6 and September 2nd. That it came and it, and it conquered and victory could be declared, but there are still battles to be played out. There are still tensions that will be had that the kingdom is here now, but one day it will be a decisive and formal surrender of the enemy. And until that day, we still have to walk through battles. Until that day, we still have to be a people who are able to live in the tension that the kingdom, the rule and reign of God is here and now, but also not yet. That one day there will be a decisive and a formal undeniable victory where Jesus returns and all things will be made right. But until then, it is up to us in the power of the Spirit to walk out in the tension that the kingdom is here now and not yet. That means that we are sometimes not going to see the things happen that we want to see happen. Sometimes we won't see the healings happen that we think should happen. Sometimes those prayers won't be answered, but if we, don't, if we aren't careful, we won't realize that there is probably more available to us in the here and now than we will ever press into. There is more kingdom available to us in the here and now than we will ever take advantage of. There is more ability for heaven to break into earth if we are willing and if we are willing to be filled up with the presence of God than we can ever possibly know. And that's available to you and, you and me. And we need people. The world, a digital Babylon, needs people who are willing to live in the tension between the here, now, and the not yet. Because there are, man, there are so many people who are just waiting for an experience of God to break into their here and now. Digital Babylon brings with it Digital Babylon brings with it a phenomenal access, but we forget the phenomenal access that we have to God in the here and the now. Digital Babylon brings in a profound alienation, but God reconnects broken relationships and gives us a greater connectivity to one another than we could ever have in any other kingdom. Babylon brings with it 
a crisis of authority, but in the kingdom of heaven, it is clear who is ruling and reigning and his power goes uncontested. We have a greater kingdom available to us. We have a greater experience of God that we can offer the world that they are looking for, but don't have the words for. They're trying to fill it, and sometimes we try to fill it with other things that we just don't have words for, and we're looking for, what we're looking for is we're looking for the rule and reign of God, but oftentimes we go to other things. In fact, the great theologian Johnny Cash said it this way. I have tried drugs and a little of everything else. And there is nothing in the world more soul-satisfying than having the kingdom of God building inside you and growing. Thank you, Johnny Cash. There is nothing more soul-satisfying than having the kingdom of God growing inside you and building. So I want to ask you, and this is where it gets really personal for us, where have we been allowing Babylon to rule and reign in our own hearts? Where have we been looking for this instant access to a kingdom when when we were really looking for the rule and reign of God, but we've, we've settled for a kingdom of darkness? Where have we been running or escaping or numbing and trying to get the effects of the kingdom of God in the here and now when all the time it was available to us in the person of Jesus? That's the reality of the kingdom of light that is available to us. I want to ask you to reflect on that with me this next week, and I want to invite you into praying a really simple prayer. We're going to be doing our 21 days of prayer and fasting. In addition to that, I would like you to be praying this prayer just reflectively. It requires time set aside. It requires dedication just to to lay aside a few moments and just to pray this prayer because what the world, you and I, and the world needs more than ever is somebody who is willing to go first and to to have an experience in the kingdom of God under the authority and rule and reign of God so that we can give it to others. And I want to ask you just to desperately pray this prayer just as Jesus prayed it. And I want us to be a people who pray, let your kingdom come in, and then you can just fill in the blank. And here's how I personally pray it. Lord, let your kingdom come in my life, in my heart, as it is in heaven. Let your rule and reign, your uncontested rule and reign, let it touch my heart. And then I extend it and I say, Lord, let your kingdom come in my family. Maybe that's your spouse or your kids or your grandkids or your parents or those around you that you consider to be family. Let your kingdom come in my family. Let it touch their hearts. Let it dispel any sense of Babylon at all. Lord, let your kingdom come in my friendships. Lord, let your kingdom come in my, the lives of my coworkers and in my city, in my neighborhood. Let your kingdom come. We need to be a people who desperately cry out for the coming of the kingdom that we may see an outpouring of the spirit of God. One that is tangible, that affects our everyday reality. One that actually changes things. Not just principles and things we've learned to recite, but actual change. Not just head knowledge, but experienced life living that we can pass on to other people and that we ourselves receive. We have a God with the authority to change lives. We have a God that has the ability and the the royal power to make a change in our everyday, in the darkness of our neighborhoods. I don't know about you, but there's times that I just pay attention to what's going on in Yakima and it can feel like a very, very dark place. We have a God that when we allow him to, will push back the very present darkness in Yakima. We have a God who rules and reigns with the authority to push the darkness back first in our own hearts. And we need that to come. We need to desperately pray. We need, we need the rule and reign of God to touch the hearts of people in this room and outside of this room. The people that come and broke into Jason's car last week. We need the rule and reign of God to touch the hearts of the girls who gather behind our building to smoke pot. We need the kingdom of God to come in and touch the, the hearts of those who are experiencing and hiding the broken relationships in their own marriage. 
You see, when we allow the kingdom to come, things will actually change. I truly believe that we will see a statistical difference in the crime in our own neighborhoods when we invite the kingdom to come first in us, but it takes you and I going first. Can we do that? All right, let's do that. Let's pray.